The darkening early in the morning, before the sun comes up, you can already hear the birds singing. At 4.30, it is that classic crossover between night and day where you hear the crickets creaking but also the birds chirping. The sun hasn't even started to shine yet. Brandon rolls over in his bed and eventually picks up his cell phone to check the time. It's so early, he thought to himself. I still have two hours to sleep before work. He spends the next 20 minutes thinking about the work he has to do tomorrow. Eventually Brandon falls asleep. He falls asleep for just a minute until he jerks wide awake and sees its light outside. The sun is shining brightly. When he turns over to check his phone for the time he sees it is now 7.45, and if he doesn't rush, he will definitely be late. How? It literally felt like a minute. As he hops into his pants one leg at a time while looking for a clean pair of socks. This is the third time this week. He exclaims to himself while speeding down Chilton Grove in an attempt to get a shortcut. He finally arrives at work through the back entrance and finds all his colleagues already seated by the tills. He then rushes to his till and starts to work as if he had been for 40 minutes already. Next customer please, says George pretending to be working hard while thinking about a party he wants to go to over the weekend. I told you if a client can't provide a receipt then you can't make an exchange. Mr. Harrison, the manager exclaims as he walks past George to his office. George shakes his head. This guy sucks, be a little considerate. He thinks to himself nervous that he might get called into his office for being late again. Brandon, George's colleague and friend for five years comes from the back chambers of the premises after having a smoke. Brandon smugly asks, are you finally here? As he hands George a cigarette. You are going to need this, Brandon says as George heads out back to smoke. They usually go behind the store towards the end of the storeroom where they would normally have a smoke. Amongst other things, Brandon mutters some vulgarity right before Mr. Harrison barges out of his office and toward the back where George is smoking. Harrison looks as red as a cherry in ripe season. George, would you care to explain why the hell back here and not helping clients? Do you intend on letting the clients wait outside all day in this weather? Says Harrison as he hurriedly places a notice on Brandon and George's tills. Without pausing to look around he then leaves for his office while yelling. This is the last time I am speaking to you about your attitude. Fucking asshole, George grumbles while shoving the notice to his center while thinking about Harrison's habit of saying whatever comes to mind. I'll read the notice once George gets here, for now I'll work this cue, says Brandon to himself. We're supposed to be off tomorrow, it's Friday. He thinks to himself looking hopeful. As George comes back from the back, slides the door closed and slips into his chair. It's snowy outside, he proclaims as he points toward the vent. It's quite cold at the back as well. You could use it as a freezer. Between the sounds of the tills beeping and struggling out receipts you can hear a slight whistle. If snow had a sound that is what I imagine it would sound like. Luckily I brought this flask of hot coffee, Brandon said, so used to the time of the year growing cold. He pulls his chair in and glances toward the paper in front of him and then pulls it closer and starts to read. Dear valued employee, on account of the weather and safety, the notice reads that he and George have to work late to help unload the stock from the truck before they leave to ensure that the weather doesn't stop them. This is bullshit. Why is it always us? Asks George staring at his phone. Probably because you're always getting us into trouble, jackass, says Brandon while he leaves for the storage room at the back. George and most of the other employees go there to have their lunches and take smoke breaks. 
As the day goes on and the wind shifts to a much harsher tone, the other staff members get ready to leave. Since the work they are doing is of no import at this time of the day, they get to go home before the roads get too rough to drive on. Later that day the clock strikes 4 p.m., and all the other staff have left leaving only Harrison, George, and Brandon. I will see you two tomorrow morning, said Harrison while locking his office door. He had turned the excess lights off only leaving on the overheads. There will be a shipment truck arriving at 5 o'clock and another one at 7 p.m. Please see to it that they offload everything and sign for it. You know what to do after that. Make sure that everything is accounted for and at the place they are supposed to be by morning. Ordered Harrison as he left for the door whenever a shipment comes the staff members have to account for all the stock on the truck ensuring that there is no shortage and sign for it. After signing for it, the team needs to pack everything in the storeroom at the back neatly. Harrison expects this all to be done by morning and everything to be in its place. First shipment the truck finally arrives to drop the first shipment. George finishes his cigarette and opens the storeroom doors wide. Please pack them here by the doorway and make sure to leave room for us to pass through. Thanks, guys, George says heading towards the truck. Brandon and George unpack all the boxes with the drivers, slowly refilling the storeroom. You see all sorts of different boxes, biscuits, candy bars, different pasta, washing soap and soft drinks. All the perishables they would stock on the shelves. Suddenly, they hear a loud slam coming from the front of the store as all the lights go off. Everyone goes quiet and Brandon runs to the front to check what's going on. He looks around for a while and sees nothing unusual, except for the clock lying on the floor. As he is about to turn around he notices the electrical circuit board. Leaning in closer he notices the circuit breaker is down. He switches it back on and walks back to the storeroom. Anyway, so like I was saying, there has never been any proof that any of these beard growth creams actually work. Pharma companies always tell you what you want to hear but research shows that it's genetics that plays a larger role in hair growth. He overheard George saying while standing near the truck, which is nearly empty. Finally, George leans over to pick up the last box as the driver walks over with a clipboard. 87, 88, 89, 90. Brandon counted. Okay, looks like it's all here and nothing is damaged. George signs the sheets and the truck is off. Now we have to pack this warehouse, said George. But first let me take a breath. George is always procrastinating. He can waste so much time doing nothing and finding excuses to leave the work for later. No wonder he is always in trouble. It would be great if we could get all these boxes sorted before the next shipment comes. We have about an hour and a half, said Brandon while George was on his phone checking status updates. Don't you think it's weird that almost all haunted house horror movies are centered around an old house? Asked George, completely distracted by a movie review he's reading online. I don't know how many times I can still watch the same thing. It's not even entertaining anymore. George continued second shipment. They finished packing the boxes in their categories and headed outside to wait for the next truck. The snow is coming down quite heavy. They were starting to get concerned there might be a storm coming. They both decided it might be a good idea to turn on the staff room TV to see any necessary updates. George thought that they might need to speed up with the second shipment just in case they need to leave before morning to avoid getting stuck and snowed in. The second shipment is usually the biggest one, they use two different suppliers and the brand name suppliers are the most important, higher demand items that get sold out faster since there are always more specials on these items. Waiting for the truck to arrive, 
They have another smoke and discuss new album releases by their favorite bands. Finally the truck arrives and they start to offload the boxes. The snow is coming down quite rough and the wind is blowing harder. It took them about 30 minutes to get all the boxes off and then finally George could sign off and the truck left. They spend the rest of the evening packing the storeroom and getting the boxes in the right categories. They have to wait for Harrison to arrive in the morning so that he can check their work and instruct them as to what items to pack on the shelves so that they will be ready when the store opens again. It seems perfectly logical for anyone at this point to want to go ahead and just pack the shelves but some managers don't like it all too much when employees take initiative so Brandon and George decided it would be best just to wait until Harrison comes as they finally finish packing the storeroom. Brandon, however unbeknownst to George, did send Harrison a text message alerting him to their progress in between shipments and when they finally finished checking if it was necessary to stock the shelves. Perhaps Harrison might let me know via text whether to stock the shelves in the meantime. We are still going to need to be here all night regardless of whether we finished early. I know George does want to leave early, but we could just do the work. Brandon thought to himself. Keep in mind that George is lazy and tardy and does not like to go any further than necessary, while his colleague and best friend, Brandon, has the opposite attitude. Chapter 2 The staff room it is around 10 p.m. now. They are doing nothing so they decide to go get something to eat. Sleeping is an option although it is quite a strange environment for both of them. It isn't quite possible just to sleep in the staff room. The staff room is quite comfortable. Whenever anyone spends night shift at the store, they would spend a lot of time in the staff room especially during the times they are closed on account of the weather. The staff room is set up so that there is an entire lounge suite. The lounge suite is beige. One of those old-fashioned leather sets before they came up with corner couches. The couches are set around a small, black glass coffee table and two small tables in between the two small couches and the one large couch. In the left corner of the room is a 32-inch flat-screen TV that is connected to satellite which is what they are using to keep an eye on the news just in case they need to leave before the weather gets too hectic. There are a couple of rugs on the floor. All beige as well against the front wall of the room is a big cupboard with all the dishes and upon which the plates and microwave are. Next to this table on the right, there is a small white fridge, made of plastic like most modern fridges that were made after the year 2000. Harrison makes sure the fridge is usually fully stocked. There is also a vending machine in the hall right before the door to the staff room. Finally, a small pool table on the left side of the room closer to the wall of the store has a fast Wi-Fi connection the room was set up to look like a fancy suite as per head office instructions. The corporate offices decided it was good for staff morale to have these facilities especially when you have a 24-hour store. Harrison has no say over this luckily. It is very important to note the modern decorations of this room at this point and paint a mental picture. Brandon and George walk into the staff room find some mini pizzas in the freezer and microwave them along with two cans of soda they got from the vending machine. Good thing these are covered by petty cash, says George chapter 3. The dark the evening progressed, the later it got the colder it became in that staff room so they switched on the air conditioning so that the staff room could get warmer. George lights a joint. Dude, what are you doing? Not in here, take it outside, said Brandon. Now let's hotbox this place, it will be awesome, said George. Brandon was quiet for a bit and then got up and maneuvered George towards the door at the back of the room so he could smoke inside. It won't be okay if this place smells like weed, 
said Brandon. The staff room has a door that leads to a passage outside. It's more like a fire escape, but the staff uses that door regularly to go outside to smoke. They stood outside for a while talking and passed the joint between each other. Two puffs in and there was another loud crash, and the lights went off completely. Putting out the joint, both of them run towards the inside and went to the front of the store to see what made such a loud noise. They both forgot to close the door to the outside of the staff room. It was so dark they couldn't see a thing. They looked around for a flashlight or anything they can use for light. I'll just use the flashlight on my phone, said George as they walked toward the front of the store. At the front of the store they saw nothing, no sign of anything falling and no crash. There was no evidence of a break-in. They decided to go to the upstairs offices to check if anything happened. Upstairs was quiet, obviously because there was no one there. Brandon looked through the upstairs window which was snowed over and couldn't see anything outside. Finally on the other side of the office upstairs they saw a busted old bell clock. It must have fallen, said George. How the hell can it just fall on its own? Asked Brandon it was very quiet suddenly. No wind, not a car passing by. They figured it was just one of those weird things and walked downstairs and back to the downstairs area. Chapter 4 What's Happening? They went downstairs to check the breaker again, so that they could switch the electricity back on. When they get downstairs everything looks different. With the light of the small cell phone flashlight it is quite difficult to see the place, but you can see everything has changed. The shelves, the door, the desks are all gone, there is a stage to the right of the room where Harrison's office used to be, there is a well-polished floor where the shelves used to be and where the tills were. At the back of the room towards the storeroom is a big bar counter. They saw this first as they had just come from the back staircase. They both look around in confusion. Dude, what the hell? said George. Oh, uh, was that weed laced with something? asked Brandon. I had two puffs. They look around for the circuit breaker so that they can turn on all the lights they found the circuit breaker behind the stage which was unusually is on the wall behind Harrison's office. As the lights come on the whole layout of the room is completely different. Now they can see it very clearly. All the signs, all the aisles, every last thing vanished and had been replaced by what seems like some sort of dance club. George unlocks his phone to turn off the flashlight and the top of the screen reads, No signal. This makes like zero sense, said Brandon as he walks to the back of the room towards the back where the staff room is. George, come see this, he says from behind the walls. When Brandon finally arrives, he sees that the building has been arranged into rooms, similar to a guest house or a hotel room. They continue towards where the staff room was and open the door only to find a kitchen with an old metal fridge, strange enough it looks brand new. They see a stove, a big counter, and a cupboard with crockery. Where the hell are we? asks Brandon. Everything is different. Together they decide to explore the rest of the building and head back to the area with all the doors. After trying a few doors, they notice these doors are all locked but they appear to be bedrooms. They continue on through a long, carpeted hallway to see more doors, until they finally reach a door to the outside. What they notice astonishes them. Chapter 5 Where Are We? They exit through the door to find that there is no snow. In fact, it looks like it is summer. There is a green patch of grass, a couple of streets, a lot of benches and a seating area like an outside restaurant instead of a loading area. Beyond all that they can see the whole area has been gated up securely, 
and they look around to see the entrance to a restaurant on the other side of the building that used to be an empty lot where they went to smoke. This is where the door outside the staff room went to. Too stunned to say anything they both stand in sheer confusion, wondering what is going on. They hear another loud crash followed by music, clearly coming from inside. They run inside. You can hear, Dance and Queen, by ABBA playing and there are lights flashing. What is even more surprising is a place that was closed and empty moments ago is suddenly full of people, dancing to the music while the waitresses are carrying around drinks and serving the people at the counter. I know this whole thing is weird as fuck but why the hell are these people dressed so weird? Says George checking his phone again to still find no signal. Exiting the front door, Brandon sees a full parking lot, many cars, all of which he would describe as vintage cars. Sir, you're not allowed to be back here, says a waitress to George who was still standing in the area behind the counter. Who are you? George asks. I am Madeline, says the woman who seems to be clearly alarmed by his appearance. I work here. What are you people doing here? George asks. Sir, I think you have had too much to drink she says as she calls for the security cards to escort him out. Chapter 6 The outside the security guards escorts George out of the door to where Brandon is already standing looking around and tell him to leave. Confused they both continue through the cars toward the road where they see a neon sign saying, Jeffries, and next to it another sign that says, Motel 22, this is clearly not a supermarket anymore. George says clearly not amused by the situation. It's not just something either of them can explain away. It's definitely not just the weed. A few hours passed, and they were still walking trying to find any hint of something familiar. They decided to go to George's house. It was closer. As they walked down the city, most of the city had vanished now. There are some some shops but most skyscrapers are gone. There are more empty fields that there were the previous day and most franchises that had been opening over the past few years are no longer there. It makes no sense, says George. I hope things will make sense when I get to my place. They continued on, walking faster so that they could reach George apartment block. Most of this area seems fairly empty and undeveloped. They can't just be imagining this. They can't just have imagined the past years living in this town. None of this is possible. Chapter 7 The neighborhood as they approach the corner of Croft Street and Chilton Grove they still do not see much establishment. At this point they should have passed quite a few stores and apartment complexes. The complex George stayed at was not there. Now there was just an empty field, with some bulldozers and heaps of sand. Are you sure this is the right street? Asked Brandon, somehow thinking George might have just turned too quick. This is definitely where it was, you see the center over there? It used to be right in front of it. Said George the center seemed to look quite the same but the parking is definitely smaller, and it is before some of the other changes were made that Brandon and George knew about. Fuck knows what's going on anymore, said Brandon. Let's go see if my place is still there. Brandon lives to the south of the island, which is quite a distance from George's place. It was a house. They would have to catch a ride there, not knowing at all at this point how they would even do that. Chapter 8 Brandon's place they finally make it to the middle of town where things were a bit more similar to what they remember you can still catch a bus in the area. So they decided to wait at the stop until the next bus arrived. It will be about 30 minutes until the bus arrives. The longer they wait the more they panic, questioning reality. This is unreal, 
It seems as if we were somehow taken back in time or entered a portal to a place where the town has not developed since the 70s, said Brandon thinking that everything he knows about science and facts are a lie the bus finally arrives after about 45 minutes of waiting there. They get on the bus to be very surprised that the bus fare is 80% of what they would pay now. Amazed by this they seem more convinced that this is, in fact the past, not entirely sure of how they even got here. Maybe just a really bad hallucination. George thinks with a bus it still takes a while to get to Brandon's place. It takes a bit longer with all the stopping for other passengers on the way. When they finally get to where Brandon lives, you can see the whole neighborhood is different. So much has changed. Walking through the neighborhood Brandon can see most of the houses around where he lives but he can also clearly see that this is well before any renovations or any of the new road work had been done which had taken place over the last 50 years. The yards were all neat, the roads were empty and everything was incredibly quiet. He opened the gate and tried to unlock his door but the key wouldn't fit. Eventually, they knocked on the door but there was no answer. They waited outside for a while, not knowing what else to do or where they could go. They haven't spoken to anyone since they were tossed out of the nightclub and it hasn't occurred to them yet to check the date with anyone. Finally it strikes Brandon. He knows he needs to ask someone. They see a red Mini Cooper driving in the distance and turn into the street. Slowly it approaches and eventually turns into the driveway. A middle-aged gentleman and a lady, not much younger, get out of the car. Both of them stumble over to the car where the gentleman meets them. Good day, gentlemen, may I assist you? The man asked Brandon continued to introduce them while George was silent, completely silent. Hi, sir, I am Brandon and this is my friend, George said Brandon George looked around in a hopeless state. He still thinks he lost his mind. Good afternoon, you can call me Big Jeff and this is my wife Caroline, said this man. What can we do for you gentlemen? Brandon continued to explain that they were both lost and that they have no idea where they are. He asked questions about where this place was and how long they have been living there. Turns out this is a family home and Jeff and his wife have been staying in this house for five years now. It had been empty for years before they bought it. What is today's date, sir? Asked Brandon. It's the twelfth, said Jeff. You boys look exhausted. Why don't you come inside for a minute? Said Caroline as she went toward the door and opened it. Nothing inside the house is as Brandon remembers it. The furniture is fair new but definitely antique. They have the same wooden designs that his parents have in the basement. Or at least had. He thinks to himself if his parents are alive right now, they would be very young. They probably did not even live in this area yet since they moved after they got married and when they were about to give birth to him. Walking around they stumble upon a calendar that says, 1973. What the fuck? George whispered to himself as he sank down to a sofa close by. If it wasn't obvious before, it definitely is now. There's no denying they are no longer in their time but have managed to get themselves back to the past somehow. Brandon thought to himself that he should possibly be honest and ask this lovely couple for advice based on their situation, but honestly who would believe them? Eventually the time came where the couple started asking them where they were from and where they needed to be but neither of them could answer. The boys told them they came from the club and needed to be back there. Brandon wanted to retrace their steps from the moment everything changed and recalled vaguely seeing a strange old-fashioned clock upstairs. He figured that it would probably be the place to start. The club is on the complete opposite side of town said Jeff and then offered to drop them off to which they accepted. 
When they arrived back at the club it was about 5.30 in the evening, the club was not open yet. They should be opening around 7, said Jeff. They greeted Jeff and left They walk around town marveling at all the changes. The MacDonald down the street is a roadhouse. The cafe up the road from that is completely gone and a sandwich shop in its place. Their competitors which was down the block from them is just an empty building. At least the filling station is still where it was but not nearly as busy. The streets are much quieter. The parks are cleaner. Both of them that they walked past earlier and the daycare they remember close to George's apartment building is a music school. The craziest thing is I saw about four record stores on the way back here, said George. Probably the only thing about this fucked up place I actually like, well, things are much cheaper here, said Brandon. They keep walking around town until they eventually sit at one of the tables at the roadhouse behind the club. Once the club open they will have to sneak in and go upstairs. Finally the club opens and the guys manage to get past the gate at the back, down the hall with the red carpet, and up the stairs next to the kitchen. They get up the stairs and it's just another floor with rooms. Instead of one big empty lot with filing cabinets and desks, it is now used for accommodation. They tried a few doors but could not get any of them open. Eventually they had to give up. My friend, I don't know what else to do, we are stuck, said Brandon George Cries, Chapter 7. Six months later George wakes up. It is 6.30 a.m. on December 20th, 1973. It's quiet outside. He can hear a slight breeze. He needs to be at work at 8 o'clock for cleanup. George gets out of bed and gets ready for work. He leaves the back room he is renting from an elderly lady on the south side of the island as he locks up and leaves to go wait for the bus. He meets Brandon at the club where they both work cleaning and maintain the rooms of the motel. It has been difficult but they have survived. Still unable to find any way back to their time, they settled and managed to both get jobs at that same club for minimum wage. It has been six months since that dreadful, crazy evening and they are both coming to terms with the life they now live. A lot has changed since the moment they entered the strange new world, or rather old world but the thing that changed the most is that George is now always on time for work, he is focused and always ready working as hard as he can until he drops to bed late at night. Brandon lives at the motel. Theirs was a cheap room to rent, and he jumped for the opportunity. He now has a girlfriend. He met her one evening outside the club when he had to help her to her car. None of them have seen or heard of their parents since. They seem to have disappeared off the face of the earth. No relatives as far as they recall but they do see Big Jeff and his wife Caroline frequently. They think about the life they left behind and still don't know what could have happened but they are stuck and now they live in the 70s. Chapter 8 The Life They Left Harrison Walks over whistling toward the store, ready to relieve George and Brandon from their hard night's work. He unlocks the front door and walks through the aisles. Everything seems in place. George, Brandon? He calls out. No answer he calls again still no answer he walks to the back of the store and find the storeroom all neatly packed. Well, they couldn't have left. He said to himself he hears faint whisper. What the hell is going on man? Where are we? What's happening? What is this place? How'd we end up here? Harrison opens the door of the staff room to find Brandon and George dressed in strange clothes looking confused. Hey guys, good work on the packing. Take the day off. You can do the shelves on Monday, says Harrison. The guys exchange confused looks. He sends them off. They have no idea where they are. This is not their world. Who is that guy? What was he talking about? Why does everything look so different, so busy, so many new designs and shops? 
The confused boys walked down the road exploring the weird futuristic world they just found themselves in. Last they remember they were on their way home from a late night at a club they were visiting for the first time. The bus they were in swerved and now they are here. What the hell happened? 